Our first speaker is Annie Kai, who worked with Dr. Charles S. Hoffman at Boston College, and she's speaking on determining the amino acids involved in inhibition of PDE4B by structurally diverse compounds. Thank you, Dr. Ricker. Um, I'm sure everyone here must be wondering, what exactly is PDE4B? Well, PDE4B is a specific variant of this enzyme called phosphodiesterase, which functions in cellular signaling. So shown here is a typical um, signal transduction pathway. Um, the signal begins when a chemical messenger, frequently a hormone, binds to a cell surface receptor. And then this activates the enzyme endoleocyclase, which synthesizes a second messenger known as cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP then activates um, protein kinase A, which goes on to phosphorylate other proteins, setting forth this whole cascade of phosphorylating reactions, which finally terminate in the cellular response. Now, PDE's role here is to degrade cyclic AMP. And this is very important. Sorry, this is very important because then the cellular response will be terminated as soon as the initial chemical messenger is absent. And this will allow the cell to start responding to new um, or repeated signals. And judging by the fact that cyclic AMP is involved in so many diverse biochemical pathways in the whole body, uh, for example, the production of cortisol, um, the breakdown of lipids, and a lot of others, the, the importance of phosphodiesterase really can't be overstated. It also turns out that PDEs are really good drug targets because of their diversity and their specificity. So in humans, there are 11 different families of phosphodiesterases, and due to alternative splicing, um, this can give rise to more than 100 isoforms or structural variants. And this is really good because these isoforms are distributed across different tissues and they control specific biochemical pathways. So this property gives us the perfect opportunity to target certain disease pathways without affecting the rest of the perfectly normal pathways. But unfortunately, it is pretty difficult to have a selective PD inhibitor because PDEs generally show quite a lot of structural similarity. Like, for example, their catalytic domain is basically conserved. So you, you pretty much can have a selective a competitive inhibitor. So we have to work with other binding sites, sites, like regulatory domains as well as substrate binding domains. Using this principle, in fact, researchers have come up with a number of truly life-changing drugs. Now, shown here is Anoximo, which is a PD3 inhibitor. It treats cardiac failure, so oh, it saves a lot of people's lives. And this one, Sildenafil, um, is a PD5 inhibitor. You probably know it under the trade name Viagra. Well, this one, I would say, enhances people's lives. <laughs> and last but not least, you have Rolipram, which researchers have previously tried um, to use that to treat depression, um, as well as autoimmune diseases. However, there is one big problem with Roliprem. It's just not selective enough. It inhibits both PD4B, which causes the anti-inflammatory effect, but also 4D, which just causes people to vomit. Um, so ideally, we'd want to have a PD4B-specific inhibitor so as to minimize the emesis effect. So this is where my research comes in. Because my mentor's lab previously identified through a random chemical assay three different compounds which um, have been shown to show uh, specific PD4B inhibition, but we don't know the mechanism. So now I want to find out um, exactly the amino acids involved in specific PD4B inhibition. And this information will be useful in informing um, rational drug design in the future, as well as to enhance um, these three inhibitors. So this is an overview of my methods. I'm basically following like a classic um, forward genetics approach. So I first generated a whole pool of mutants, and then I transformed a yeast whole cell with these mutants and searched for uh, phosphodiesterases, which are resistant to the inhibitors. And after we get our mutants of interest, we then um, get out their gene and do GNA, uh, DNA sequencing. And then we compare that with the original wild type, and you probably see like um, amino acid changes. And we think that these changes, these amino acids, are probably the ones involved in specific PD4B inhibition. So this is my first step, a random mutagenesis. Uh, we exploited PCR's propensity for error in generating a whole pool of mutants, and we used six different buffers, which have been previously shown to confer different rates, as well as types of mutations. 
then after we get this very variable um, mutant pool, we transformed um, S. pombi, which is a type of fission yeast, with these genes. Um, so that this is transformation. And following that, we began the really long process of screening for interested candidates. So first, not all of the mutant PDEs are actually going to be functional. There could be too many mutations. So we first had to find colonies which had an active PDE in the first place. So we used the iodine staining assay, where all the dark colonies over here were ones that had active PDE. And then we transferred them over to four different microtidal dishes containing neutron medium, as well as DMSO and the three different chemical inhibitors. We then screened the whole bunch under the microscope. Uh, most of them are going to be uh, successfully inhibited, meaning that PDE is inactive. And you'll be able to see these very long, slightly sickly looking cells. Whereas in those rare ones where PDE was actually active, you'll be able to see signs of mating. So this is a zygote over here, and this is an ascus, which kind of looks like a pea pied. <laughs> and following that, we had a purified colony to remove um, contamination in previous steps. So we got these pure colonies over here of the 18, 18 colonies which were of interest. And following that, we repeated the iodine staining assay just to find colonies which showed uh, inhibitor resistance. So you can see here that we identified five colonies. But I want to draw your attention to this D19, because you notice that it actually stayed darker in the inhibitor plates than in the control plate, which tells us that um, counterintuitively, the inhibitors seem to have activated this enzyme instead of inhibited. So this is the most interesting one, and it was also the one we sent eventually for DNA sequencing. But before that, we had to get that gene of interest out. So we used this method called um, smash and grab, which is developed by my mentor quite some time ago. So the basic idea is kind of like you know, smashing open the glass windows of a bank and then letting the money inside roll out. Because what we did was we vortexed the cell with a glass bead so as to break open the cell membrane, and then the cellular matter would come out. And then we used phenochloroform to separate the nucleic acid from the other biological matter. So after we got our purified DNA, we sent it for sequencing, and here's our result. We found that there was one protein mutation from um, substitution from aspartic acid to glycine at position 468. And to further appreciate the significance of this mutation, uh, we did structural analysis using Chimera, which is a protein analysis software. So, okay, this comes to the most interesting part. So, we saw that the substitution occurred near a cavity that could be a new allosteric regulatory site. Uh, yeah, let me show you why. So this part, you know, it kind of looks like a pocket, which is flanked by three different um, alpha helices. And then you have this random disordered region over here, which kind of looks like a flap. So we thought that might be a gate regulating excess. So this is a top view, which shows the alpha helices and the flap more clearly. This is another one, the cavity, alpha helices, and the flap. And that's not all. If we look at amino acid residues lying within this cavity, we see that there is actually one bulky tryptophan residue lying right in the center of that cavity. So this could be a regulator of excess into the cavity. You know, just looking at a structure, it kind of resembles like those car park electronic gates. They will go up and down to let cars in. So this is further evidence that this could be an allosteric regulatory site. Moreover, we also see a good distribution of hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues within this site. And if you think about it, it makes sense because most biological molecules have a bit of both. So this, this site will be able to accommodate the binding of both the hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts of a possible biological molecule which binds to it. Oh, so this is another view showing the residues more clearly. So in conclusion, we have previously identified through the, um, the experimental step that there is this compound BC35 that instead of inhibiting the phosphodiesterase, actually activates it. And we also did analysis um, on the substituted glycine, and we found that it's located near a pocket, which we have, we have gathered evidence to kind of, which we think that it could be an allosteric regulatory site based on the evidence I've just shown you. 
And this is great because we may have found a possible target site for PD4B specific inhibitors. What this means is that we may have actually uh, the, uh, gone through the first step towards creating a drug that can maybe cure COPD or asthma or arthritis without causing people to vomit all day. So that's great news. Um, and just to confirm our um, inference just now, we would like to perform this crystal structure analysis of the mutant uh, phosphodiesterase complex with um, this compound BC35, just to verify whether our site was really the one that the compound was bound to. And also, there is also a slight margin for error just now, because um, we had multiple plasmid copies inside the cell, so this the observation that we made could be simply due to the fact that there were multiple phosphodiesterases expressed. So the better model of physiological conditions who would like to have only a single copy inside the cell. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation by thanking all the wonderful people who made this project possible. First and foremost, my mentor, Dr. Charles Hoffman from Boston College. Um, also my tutor, Mr. Tripranani, who offered many insightful comments on my paper as well as presentation. And the TAs, uh, Joseph, Laurie, and Jody, who gave me a lot of helpful comments as well. Um, CE, MIT, and the Ministry of Education Singapore for making this opportunity possible. And thank you very much. Questions for Eddie? Yes. Beautiful uh, talk and beautiful work. And I'm wondering, um, the two variants, PD4D and PD4B, how much variability there is between them? And how the specific sites that you found confer resistance to the compound in 4D uh, actually different in amino acid? Uh, in the, the 4 variant. Um, so, okay, so the question was, are there, um, what are the structural differences, was it? Amino yeah, yeah, amino acid differences between um, PD4B and PD4D, and whether we have found uh, another allosteric site on 4D, or, or, or binding site? The site conferring resistance in 4D is indeed different in, in the amino acid residue. When you the 4B and the 4B. Oh, yeah. And whether this site that we identify with 4B is actually different from the ones that might be present in 4D. So, um, for the first question, I'm not quite sure exactly in the primary sequence how different it is. But 4B and 4D are part of the same gene family, so they arise due to um, alternative splicing. So, I think the difference is that uh, they have a conserved catalytic do domain, and to different um, untrans ups upstream untranslated regions, uh, so, and that makes the two structures different. But as for your other question, we only investigated for B, and these compounds are the ones that already have been shown in previous experiments to be uh, selective only to for B. So why I am not very sure about the um, active um, the, the binding sites in for D, I think that this should pretty much be a site that's specific to for B only. It wasn't clear how many trials that you ran, and, and was, was there any sort of investigation of, of statistical significance of this uh, excitation result that you presented? Oh, the question was um, how many trials have I ran, and was there any, uh, to, to prove the statistical significance of this? Oh, um, actually, we ran, we ran the whole experiment twice, but only the second time you did this result. So, um, that, 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 that was why we had to go with a further, further step of confirmation using the crystal structure analysis, just to make sure that this, was re, this site that we identified was really the one that inhibitor was bound to. Yes. Yes. I wonder if you can explain why, when you look at the single cell, uh, why you see variability in the inhibition between different cells in the same population? Oh, sorry, this is going to take a while. Yeah, so the question was um, explaining why we see variability among the cells in the same colony. Um, there are actually several reasons. One is that, firstly, not all the cells are actually going to be undergoing mating. 
because when the cell is put into a glucose deficient environment, so they are stressed, they could either go into stationary phase or they could start mating. So some of the shorter cells you see around here are not mating, but they also have active PDE because they're going to stationary phase. And the different morphologies you observe here um, are different stages of the mating cycle. So a zygote is when two cells first started getting fused. And this is after cell division, I mean, meiosis has already taken place, so there is four within the ascus. And actually, it's not shown here, but after that, then you have the spores um, stage where this, this um, outer membrane will lies, and this, all these spores, spores inside will be released. Are there some other questions from the judges? Yes, I have more general questions since I'm not in your field. Um, you, you described how you started with a very standard met methodology. Um, could you explain any points along the way where you had to make choices about how to proceed farther and how you made those decisions? Okay, so the question was, was there any point um, during, during my experiment where I had to make choices about whether to proceed further and or decide between, or, or decide between alternative procedures? Okay. Um, where, where was it? Um, there actually was quite, quite a few I can think of now. Um, like, for example, during transformation, the first time we decided to be greedy and introduce a lot of plasmids, so, so, so as to hope for a higher cell yield. But that actually kind of backfired because we ended up with this whole lawn of cells and we, we couldn't pick up individual colonies at all. So we had to modify that, proceed a little bit. So now we, we um, divided the number of plasmids by four. And while it resulted in less number of colonies, they were really well separated. So that made screening a lot easier. Um, then also, during here, the plasmid extraction and DNA sequencing stage, we also had a couple of alternatives. Uh, we were initially thinking about um, first transferring this to E. coli and then doing a plasmid prep, but because of time constraints, we couldn't do that. There was also another method where, uh, so, oh, so, Instead of doing that, we kind of did a lazier method, which, which is that we got the gene product directly from yeast without doing a clean up, cleaning up step from yeast to E. coli. So we wholesale amplif amplified the, the yeast gene so that you, you have all the DNAs inside, get, inside it getting amplified. But we also had to do uh, another restriction digestion. Oh, okay, this is gonna be kind of complicated because um, the, in the plasmid, we have this CGS22 sequence that's flanking our PD4B gene. And this CGS22 sequence happens to be also within the chromosome. So that when we, when we constructed primers to uh, flank this PD4B gene on the plasmid, we also inadvertently um, use the plasmids to flank the, the, the sequences on the original CGS2 gene within the chromosome. So that was proved to be quite a problem. Then we eventually circumvented this problem by using a restriction digestion enzyme that cut the, the DNA sequence within the chromosome, leaving only the ones flanking the PD4 gene in the plasmid intact. So, um, yeah. Mr. Strike? Just a quick question, kind of building off the last question. What do you think your sort of your own personal greatest contribution <coughs> to this project was, or where did you demonstrate kind of creativity more in the experimental design or in the discovery of the site? Or I would like to hear what you think. Oh, the question was, where did I think I made a greatest contribution to the, um, the experimental discovery of this? Um, so, well, like during all of these steps, um, I discuss a lot with my mentor um, about how to optimize the different steps. So like for this step between the genes, um, so I was like thinking of reducing the number of number of plasmids and stuff. So I would say this whole process was like is, is not only initiated by my mentor, but like a discussion between my mentor and I. So we at each stage we optimize different steps. And you were instrumental in each stage of the process. Yeah. So my mentor and I we basically took this product together. Okay. Yeah, nice work. Are there any other questions from the judges? Let's thank Annie.